Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Legendarium Podcast. I am Craig, your host, here with another author shelf series or an author shelf installment <clears throat> in the series. I am here with Ursula Vernon. Now, hang on a second. You're saying I've never heard of Ursula Vernon. <laughs> well, that's that's by design. Uh, you might have heard of T. Kingfisher, though. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, Miss Vernon Kingfisher, I don't, I don't know what to call you at this point. Some days I don't know which one to call me either. And actually, if you're <laughs> under the age of 12 the, or children's librarian, you might have heard of Ursula Vernon. But uh... Oh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> yes, but these days, is, yeah. these days it's T. Kingfisher. And, and you, so you used to write a lot of children's stuff. Now you're shifting more toward the adult side of things, right? Yeah, and we needed a pen name for that because uh, there's a tendency for – it, parents, if their kids uh, aren't big readers and mm. they find an author they like, the parent will just go buy everything by that author sight unseen. And so you would wind up with, you know, a, a, a nine year old who had been reading the, the Hamster Princess books suddenly buried under a weight of uh, adult contemporary horror or fantasy romance. <laughs> and uh, I, I, Probably nothing that would scar them for life, but uh, certainly some things that would bore them, which is not something we want to do to, to young readers. I, I've, I know I've told this story on the show before, so I apologize to anybody who's getting a repeat. But Christmas, when I was 13 years old, or maybe 12, I had been reading a bunch of Michael Crichton, you know, I read Sphere and Jurassic Park and Congo. And so my brother was looking for a Christmas present for me. And he goes to the bookstore and just grabs a Michael Crichton book off the shelf and wraps it up and gives it to me. I opened it up and started reading it. It was Disclosure. Um, and it's a, the, story of, uh, it, the story of the first sexual harassment case that a man won against his female boss back in the 80s, I think. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> it was different. It was not the same as the Michael Crichton I was used to. Not, uh, not, not quite on par with Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I get that. Wow. You know, we're a few minutes into this already, and we haven't even mentioned what we're talking about today. Uh, welcome to the show, I guess. That's uh, the legendarium tangent Glad to is be a real here. thing. Uh, today, we're talking about Tail Chaser's song by Tad Williams. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm embarrassed that it took me so long to say this, but that is what we're doing. We're talking about Tail Chaser's song. If, for those unfamiliar with the author's shelf, what we do is uh, we invite an author, like, uh, an author like Ursula on and say... Uh, what would you like to discuss? Pull a book off of your shelf and we'll read it and discuss it with you. So that's what we're doing today. This was your pick, Ursula. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll give people just a brief rundown. This is, yeah, there you go. If you're watching on YouTube, that was the cover. Yes, I've held up an extremely battered copy. Uh, that should tell you how many times I've read this. I, I, was, I figured <laughs> as much, yeah. This is, uh, I think it was published in 1985, and it's yep. Tad Williams' first published novel. Uh, and there's a great foreword in uh, newer editions that he wrote in the 90s, kind of explaining where he was at in his life. And, um, but what it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a very traditional fantasy quest story told through the eyes of cats. Uh, and it is really something. It it's, is, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it, I, I'm seeing it called an homage to Tolkien and all that stuff, and I'm sure he had a lot of that in mind. I'm, it, this was the mid '80s, after all, uh, so a lot of Tolkien derivative stuff going on. Which, hey, fine by me, right? Yeah. But anyway, uh, Ursula, I wanted to ask you my first question, which is the same first question I ask everybody on the author's shelf, which is, why'd you pick this book? Whoa. Uh, this was this was literally one of my very favorite books growing up, and it's one of the only ones that I never see anyone talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, if you talk to uh, fantasy authors, uh, a, a vast number of us loved the book Watership Down with a deep and undying passion. It, it I, I don't know why that one, but so many of my peers like, oh God, yeah, that was you know one of the great books that I read when I was young, and for whatever reason, I think they. Uh, Parents and librarians assumed that because it was about talking rabbits that it was appropriate for children, which I mean, I'm not saying it's inappropriate for children, but it's, it's uh, not designed for children. 
Yeah, and, and if you, uh, uh, a whole generation uh, of, of those of us who grew up in the, the 80s uh, were deeply scarred by the animated film, which I loved, and as scarring as it was, I, I, I would insist every time we went to Blockbuster for a while, I would want to rent Watership Down, even though, you know, which has the horrible frothing rabbit, you know, fight scenes and whatnot. And it was what? awesome. But. Anybody out there who doubts what children in the 80s and 90s went through, go back and actually watch The Land Before Time again. That is rough. Oh, my Holy God. Holy smokes. You know, yeah. so some of these animated movies that we grew up with were not, they were not the sanitized affair that we tend to get these days, right? Yeah, they, uh, uh, I mean, Disney still was, but there was a lot more sort of around right. the edges that, uh, that, uh, Don Bluth was still working then, and, and a lot of it, yeah, weird stuff was going on. Uh, the eighties were just weird in general. <laughs> and the thing is that I, I loved talking animal books as a kid. I mean, like you know that, like I started on Narnia when I was very young. Of oh, course, yeah. then I just wanted more of that, and uh, so then I had Watership Down, and that was it. Like. Kids today uh, have it so lucky because you get, you know, they have all the warrior cats and the guardians of gold, scads and scads of these. Mm -hmm. We had Watership Down and we liked it. And this came out, uh, let's see, 85. So I would have been like eight or nine and mm. uh, picked it up. And it was not only everything that I had wanted in being like a, a watership down kind of book, but it like took it all to 11. It just cranked all the dials of uh, like, yes, it's talking cats and then things get absolutely out of control wild. Like you can, uh, Tad Williams, you know, has written a lot of, of fantasy novels later on and, uh, and science fiction, like the other land books that frankly, I don't know why they never made a, blockbuster netflix series mm -hmm. out of the other land books uh so you you can see the, the the sheer spectacle that he is capable of in in those and you can see the first like stirrings of it in in this first book it's because it could have so easily just been you know talking cats go on an adventure and deal with humans or whatever, but no, it's just straight into weird cat gods it's, and messed up stuff. <laughs> yeah, if you if you told somebody the the barest plot that I gave, yeah, it's an adventure quest story with cats, right? You're like, oh, is it like Homeward Bound, the Incredible Journey? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. not. <laughs> it, it is, is it, yeah. Even if, so, like you say. It, it, he cranks those dials up. So the book starts with um, with a, a mythology. It's the creation myth of this uh, th these cats, right? Um, and e every every species in the book thinks that they're the primary species on the planet, right? And everybody else is just kind of around them, uh, much like we do. But so he <laughs> creates this mythology, this this creation myth, and tells you that. And so you're already like, what is going on? And then for the first couple of chapters, it's just like, oh, yeah, there's a cat and he goes to this house and gets fed by these humans. And then he goes into yeah, the forest with his friends. And you're like, oh, wow, this is it's nice. You know, yeah, little, it's sort of sweet. Calm, there's there's cheesy. some backstory, you know. OK, yeah, he lost his family early on. That's, you know, that's uh, sad, but it, it's very you know, you're like, okay, this is nice, normal cat living a normal life, like the sort yep. of cat that I am aware of. And then just and then it goes way off the rails <laughs> he goes my favorite part the the part when i was like oh okay he's going this direction was when they had just started on their quest uh, to give people a little background this this cat um has a friend and the friend has gone missing and a bunch of other cats have gone missing so they're investigating trying to figure out where all these cats are going um and so he goes on the quest to find the cat and runs into some squirrels and the squirrels uh are are mad at him for invading their territory and, and he says something along the lines of i'm not quoting here but i'm paraphrasing he says you know let me talk to you and, and your leader and i you shall not be molested nor shall you be whatever and i'm like oh okay all right so even the dialogue like once he once he actually goes into the forest you know much like tolkien I, this is a, a, a giant homage to tolkien once you get into the forest you've left regular stuff behind and you're in epic world now and so we're going to crank that dialogue 
dial up. Yeah, and, 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 and it's not like it's not twenty four seven sort of talking no. dialogue. There's a lot, but but whenever you know the the uh, our hero tail chaser is is speaking, you know, is trying to calm someone down or something. It, it goes into very formal, you know, mm-hmm. I'm speaking to the ca- council of Elrond kind of uh, <laughs> uh, phrasing, and it's uh, yeah and. I, I, how, mu- how much spoilering do we do on this show, Iris? Let's let's talk about the book for you know uh, in broader terms for a few more minutes, okay? And then uh, <laughs> you know in in five or ten minutes. So be warned, <laughs> listeners, be warned. We will uh, be spoiling this book, this forty year old or what? How, thirty? <laughs> this thirty year old book. Um, it, we are no, going to no, spoil it. If it was eighty five, it's thirty seven years. Oh God, I should never. Uh, have gee, done I know. That. Don't don't get me started. <laughs> but, but I, you know. I think that's actually probably a good place to start. If we're trying to sell people on this book, you know, who haven't read it before and say, hey, this is worth your time. One of the things I would say is that this is extremely familiar territory outside of the fact that it's cats and they have weird names and he's made up some different words and pronunciations and stuff. But outside of that, the story itself is extremely familiar. And so if you're looking for something that is that that's not your standard quest narrative. Um, well, this, this is that right. Uh, but he does it really well and it is different because it's cats. And so he gets to have yeah. a lot of fun with that. Right. What, what would you add on to, uh, to no, tell I think somebody you're right. who's it's, it, it is, it is a, a sort of comfortable quest narrative of the sort that we're used to, you know, it's, it's the, the, uh, uh, uh I mean, he's he's not a farm boy with a destiny, but he might as well be. He, he's about as close as a cat can get. Yeah. And, you know, gets the call to adventure. His friend goes missing. Darker things are happening in the world. He sets out on a quest to find it. You know, they go to the, the this huge city of cats, to uh, to the queen of cats, to court to ask uh, what's going on. And uh, but but the thing is, these aren't. Uh, these are cat cats. They're not like anthropomorphic cats. They're not, right. uh, they're, they're cats. They eat mice. They, they, uh, you know, use litter boxes. They're that kind of cat. And, <laughs> uh, but the language is still, it, it doesn't feel like dated eighties kind of thing. Like, like uh, much as, as I love the time, if you pick up sort of Shannara or whatever now, or uh, Dennis McKiernan, but early Dennis McKiernan right. books, you're like, Okay, yeah, this feels like '80s post Tolkien, you know. Okay, oh, yeah. there's like the, this. This has a very has uh, the the language holds up in a a much more modern fashion. I want to say there's uh, it possibly because it is all cats and made up, and there is there are no references to uh, things that you know we would normally now be oh ho hum. I've seen that one before. <laughs> Right, oh, okay. Right. Are we calling the hobbits halflings? Or are we calling them what in this one? Or oh, they're they're waros this one. Okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, but uh, it uh, so it, it it fits kind of into that narrative, but it doesn't have the it, it doesn't feel cliche in the same way. Like you read it and you don't necessarily know what's going to happen on the next page, or if it happens, it's going to take a much different shape than it would in a Shannara book, or you right, know, right, whatever. yeah. Which is actually, it, that's a good book to bring up because um, it, just to situate Tail Chaser's song in, uh, in the fantasy genre, uh, The Sword of Shannara was published in 77. And that was the first um, American kind of Tolkien clone. Um, there there had been some others who who riffed on Tolkien, um, but but that was the first kind of Tolkien clone was in 77. And so now we're eight years later in 85 and some of those, um, some of those cliches had already been worn out. It took like three years, right? Yeah. You go read something in like 1980, 1981 and the cliches are rich and, you know, abundant. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so by the time we get to 1985, now we, we still have, uh, you know, he, like we said, he's sticking with the bones of the quest uh, but he's trying to do something a little different and, and kind of kick off some of those cliches. And uh, but that doesn't mean it's not very, very familiar. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's, but it's a nice familiar as opposed to oh god, this again. Usually, in my experience, I am biased, of course, because it's one of my favorite books. But uh, <laughs> if you're like, if you're going, no, I already read the Belgarian. I don't need to read another quest fantasy. No, it's not like that. 
<laughs> it, this is not the Belgaria. That is true. Which we did cover. If people are curious, we did cover the Belgaria back in like I want to say episode forty ish. Go go way way back in our catalog, and we we did that one. Um, we also did Shinara. So um, okay. So I wanted to ask you about more about your experience with this book. You've talked about how you came to it as a kid, um, loving just talking animal stuff. Um, I, I have to imagine you got to Redwall at some point in the 90s. Um, uh, I actually stuff. got to Redwall after I had ostensibly aged out of when I should be reading Redwall. That did not stop me. But uh, I, no I read, thing. yeah, uh, I read like uh, 10 or 12 of them. I, I, the problem with Redwall was I read so many in rapid succession that uh, I did kind of get burned out on the quest narrative, uh, w which is very standardized in the Redwall oh, yeah. books. It, it's like... Uh, you pick up one, you know, you've, you've got, you've read most of them with, it's just different set oh, dressing. Absolutely. But, uh, and having written for kids, I absolutely understand why that works because when you're a kid, uh, a lot of times what you want is that thing I just read and loved, but more of it. So I yeah, want, exactly. yeah, so no question as to why <laughs> those worked or sold. And, uh, and I think they were probably wildly successful. Uh, and anybody as, who's had a kid in the last 15 years uh, curses the name Dave Pilkey, uh, the Captain <laughs> Underpants books and, oh, and all yes, that stuff. He yes. just cranks those things out. And like my son has a giant shelf full of Dave Pilkey stuff. Uh, no, I, but I was going to ask you. Yeah. So so you love this stuff as a kid. You you move on, you grow. But that copy, hold it up again for me, because that copy, like you said, it is battered. It is tattered. <laughs> yeah, that the, the thing cover has been is, is around just the block. barely holding on here. That yeah, is it's incredible. Uh, so yeah. you came back to it again and again. What? How? How different was it as a as a teenager, as a young adult, as an adult? Um, I guess it's probably too big a question to just say what jumped out to you differently. But are there are there little things that that you did pick up on or uh, that you enjoyed differently? Or was it more just, hey, I'm going to return to kind of a safe uh, narrative, a, a safe book that I know I love and get back into that kind of childlike mindset, which is really fun and valuable, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, as a teenager, it was very much this is a comfort read that I love. Mm. And, uh, and and I reread it uh, uh, then, too. And uh Loved it. And and a few times as an adult, I, I definitely have come back to it and been like, God, I remember how much I love this book. <laughs> uh, as uh, as me now, uh, who writes professionally for a living and has put out, you know, God knows how many of these things. Uh, <laughs> when I when I was uh, writing children's books, uh, one of the things that struck me is even though everyone thinks Talking animals are children's books. Uh, are, are, are and and I wrote two series that were you know one was a little dragon called Dragon Breath, one was Talking Hamsters, uh, Hamster Princess, and so uh, the what struck me rereading it as a children's book author is this is not actually a kids book. It it was uh, uh, despite loving it as a kid, it was I don't think marketed as a children's book and. I could not have gotten a lot of the stuff that Tad Williams does in this book past my editor now, like, oh, okay. which is a shame because the, uh, uh, there are, cause when you get to the end, things get dark, like really messed up. And I, I, and even though I think a lot of kids like that, and there are certainly, uh, dark children's books written, I, was never able to uh, uh, get anything nearly that dark past my editor for whatever reason. So we would have to have conversations like, no, we are not allowed to solve our problems with arson and uh, <laughs> other things in my books. And uh, which I, without spoiler alerts, that may be why so many of my horror novels end with just burning everything down because just frustrating. Damn it, now Pure I'm frustration. allowed. <laughs> uh, I, I joke sometimes that inside every children's book author is a frustrated horror author because there, there are so many things that, you know, you're like, the kids would love this. I would have loved this as a kid, but I can't actually get away with this. Uh, so it, it all just sort of compresses and hardens in finally into diamond. And you're like, I'm going to write something really messed up and no one is going to be able to stop me. Uh, and now I write horror novels. 
So, um, and they're and they're really messed up, and nobody stops you. <laughs> exactly. In fact, uh, there was one uh, uh, I sold to a, a tour, and the editor came back and said, "This is great, but can we really push the horror more to 11? And I, it was like. I was one of those anime heart eye emojis. I was like, no one's ever said that to me before. Uh, so I, I admire the, the sheer uh, weird, dark, horrible things that Tad Williams uh, gets away with. So coming to it as a children's book author, I'm like, damn, that was impressive. Yeah. And now coming at it to it as a horror author, occasion I admit the problem is when you're a professional author after a point, it's very hard to enjoy things anymore as just with pure enjoyment and without looking behind the curtain. Uh, yeah, you you know how you're you're like a, a stage magician going to a magic show. It's like <laughs> I admire your delivery and and you hand you did that trick really well, but I still know how you did the trick. Right. Uh, so, uh, but so reading it as as I am now, uh, and I, I miss you know, the, the sense of, of wonder sometimes, but such is life. It's also very hard to watch movies with me. I, I also <laughs> yell at the screen. Uh, so uh, the, I, I am very impressed at the way he pulled off a lot of things in this book. I'm like, I mean, as one stage producer, you, you, you did some damn fine sleight of hand there. That was, that yeah. was well handled. Yeah, and uh, I I can still really admire what he pulled off, even even though this is a a his earliest work as far as these things go. It's uh, it has a a a lot of panache, and it's also uh, Williams went into big doorstopper epics, and mm -hmm. which I respect entirely. Lord knows that uh, first of all, I don't think you came out of the '90s as a fantasy author without getting into doorstopper epics. But uh, the amount he managed to cram into this one not doorstop that was still managed to be pretty epic is pretty cool. It's that that was one of my first impressions uh, as I was going through it was the how he structured it and kind of compressed. It seemed like you're saying that he took a whole bunch of story. He took a 900 page novel and crammed it into about 400 pages or something like that. I don't know how big i don't know that copy you held up that, that's a good 500 page paperback right uh, I, I did the got, i did the uh, kindle edition so i wasn't paying attention to page count 372 and part oh, of that okay. is a glossary that's yeah he it, that yeah, was real go. compressed yeah exactly so it's there it's just event after event after event it's constant it's this barrage of adventure it's like um you know if you go back and read the hobbit again you might have forgotten just how many things happen in that short little book. This is uh, kind of reminiscent of that sort of compression. Um, and maybe we should get into some spoiler territory now because I want to ask you about the ending and whatnot. So everybody oh, yeah. has been warned. Um, you know, again, a 37-year-old book is about to be spoiled, everybody. So here we go. <laughs> So the quest, the thing that gets him going, like I said, is that he has a, he calls her his friend. What, what's her name? Pad? Uh, quiet Hush Pad. Pad. Or, Hush Pad. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Hush Pad has gone missing. And this is kind of like his best friend, the love of his life. It's, uh, you know, it, the girl. He's got to go chase down and save the princess, basically. Um, and he finds her in the end. Uh, well, close to the end. He finds her and... It's it's this this supposed to be a joyous reunion. Finally, my quest is complete. I've found Hushpad on this island with this guy who's kind of found her and, and adopted her. Um, and this feral cat, he's uh, he's semi feral, right? I, yeah, I, yeah, more or less feral. Uh, but now after this adventure, boy, he's been through it out in the wild. So we can call him a feral cat at this point. And he finds Hushpad, who's been more or less domesticated and goes, Oh, well, you know, I, I, I thought I wanted you again, you know, in my life, but uh, no, I, I guess I'm good. See yeah. Ya. And cause she's, she's very shallow. And there were sort of some, some intimations of that in, in their early sort of relationship. Like when he's in mourning for his family, she never comes to visit him and you realize, okay, this is his first love and he's grown as a person. And now is like, Oh, I can't believe I had a crush on you. 
kind of thing. Which, <laughs> but again, like you, we've all you been realize there. that this version of you realizes that. But as a kid, oh, you're yeah. you're consuming this. You know, I mean, if you come to this as a child or as a, a younger person, you come to this as a it's a quest story, and he's gonna he's gonna fulfill the quest and everything, you know, happy ending and all that. And Tad Williams is like, yeah. We're going to go with happy-ish. <laughs> we're we're going to go with satisfying, yeah. you know, rather than happy. What um, what are some of the dark things that you have on your mind when you think to yourself, "Oh boy, that that ending that got cranked up there." Uh, it's it's uh, well, it's going along, and and there are definitely some Lord of the Rings echoes, and he, he even says in the the mm-hmm. foreword that like you know there are some deliberate Lord of the Rings uh, commentary in there. Uh, so they go to like, uh, uh, the, the first home where the queen of cats lives and, and that's pretty epic. I mean, it's a big forest, uh, full of cats and it's like, okay, this is cool and sort of some epic scenery, but it's not, it's all normal cat stuff. You know, you feel like if a human walked through, they'd just be like, okay, there's a bunch of cats here whatever. And then they get to where the the villain lives and in this giant mound that he's erected, you know, in the north or whatever. And it is this horrible warren full of monsters. And like the, you come in and, and, and there is this this scene where he gets dragged into this room and there's a pit full of like a gigantic pit full of dying animals and this cat god on top of it this blind evil cat god sitting on top occasionally eating one and you're like holy crap that (laughs) is rough (laughs) yeah and and like watership down had you know a frafa the warren that was kind of that was real sort of like weird fascist rabbit warren but you know it was still like this is rabbit stuff. Okay, these are some weird rabbits, but this is a thing rabbits do. This was just like, nope, we have we have gone to the wall all the way out. This is no longer a human could wander through here. This is a, if a human wandered through there, they would wonder what uh, drugs they had taken and then the cat god would eat them. I, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was like just holy mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there reading this scene thinking to myself, it, it was almost like I was sitting next to Tad Williams as he's typing it out on his uh, his kitchen table or whatever, uh, or, or I was in his head, and I just knew he was thinking to himself, "Oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could bring in some like really uh, mythological elements? We're going to do a descent into hell." Yes, and then and so he takes a cat and puts the cat in hell. <laughs> yep. You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is amazing. Oh yeah, and and like there's uh, uh, just. And, and again, I think this is kind of a Lord of the Rings callback. He has these these mutant cats that have been made by the evil god who are like who are basically the Urukai old right, of cat, right. version of cats. And uh, then you know these uh, things that you eventually figure out are uh, like dead zombie cats that are serving the master whatever. And you're like. Okay, did did they just die, or is he getting like Egyptian mummy cats, or what's going on here? You, you don't quite get an answer to that, but it's just like every corner you turn, it's like something more messed up, and uh, you're like, okay, yeah, this is this is a place we have gone. It was it was something I wasn't quite expecting. I, I probably should have because he starts the the prologue is the mythology. Um, and so I just kind of thought that would be background for, uh, obviously I'd never read this before. Okay. Yes. This was yeah. my first time. So I thought that was just going to be background for how the cats talk to each other, how they relate, what their cultural story is. Um, and, you know, but, but that was hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, the creation of the first cat, um, <laughs> I, I probably should have been expecting it more as the book went on and got weirder and weirder, but it turns out. Yeah, that was all true. And all of these characters are still around and they're still fighting their epic war. And now Tail Chaser is in the middle of it. And uh, it was just, uh, it's, the book is worth reading at whatever age you are, if only for the sheer spectacle of how he builds and eventually ends the story. 
It reminds me, uh, we, we just did uh, The Man Who Was Thursday, G.K. Chesterton. I've read a lot of um, Chesterton, but not that one. But, yeah. yeah, it was, uh, so so another author chose that, and we read that, It was uh, it, and it was really interesting. And then in the end, it, it kind of similarly just goes off the rails. And, uh, and now I'm wondering, Ursula, if there's something with you authors loving stories that just go completely <laughs> bonkers at the end because uh, it's you know it's it's a bit like um if you're a critic for long enough you start to value uh newness yes <laughs> more and more highly it's probably something similar to that uh, yeah right? well there is a certain aspect of i have not seen this done before and and with the mythology you're right because like in watership down they you get a mythological background on the mm -hmm. the uh, Ella Herrera, the, the rabbit prince with a thousand enemies and the sun god and all. But you don't expect them to show up in the book. And indeed, <laughs> right. they do not for the most part. But uh, this would this is like, oh, no, we're going there. And uh, and, and yeah, I, I think there is a uh, uh, I, I think there are writers who there are like writers, writers who are uh, the, sort of like people, filmmakers who who make stuff for critics that critics love, and everybody mm -hmm. else is like, "Well, that's a thing that happened." Uh, <laughs> because after a point, you get sort of, you know, uh, jaded is the wrong word, but you you can you can see the beats coming, and when you can't see them coming, or they just you know are like, "Whoa, okay, you really did that." It's uh, it, it we get impressed all out of proportion. I think. Oh, and. <laughs> You know what? But that's, I think that's all right. I, this isn't something that I bring up or, or would bring up as a negative. No. Uh, it's just a different, we all place different values on stories and, and we, we value different things in them, I should say. And so, you know, if, um, if that is valuable to you, great, then find some weird stories and read them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> if, yep. if you want something, if you want uh, comfort, this isn't quite the book unless you read it when you were eight, you know, but uh, uh, it, it's not exactly a comfort read by the end, right? Not, no, but it's it's definitely a, an epic quest. And uh, the uh, Tad Williams actually said in the foreword that he included some Lord of the Rings Easter eggs and having mm -hmm. reread it just for this podcast. There's at least one point where a character says, uh, you shall not pass. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, oh, yep, got that one. Yeah, that's and, the Easter egg that you put right in the middle of the lawn for the littlest yeah. kids to find, right? Right. Well, and then immediately afterwards, uh, Tail Chaser is thinking to himself, run, you fool. And I'm like, yep, and there's the follow-up. <laughs> so. Absolutely. The one I was waiting for was uh, with the Queen of Cats. Um, I, was, I was shocked and appalled. Uh, that he didn't name his queen of cats Beruthiel. Um, <laughs> so if you read the Lord of the Rings in the Fellowship, Aragorn is tell he's talking to the hobbits and he mentions just in passing the cats of Queen Beruthiel, and nobody knows who Queen Beruthiel is, and there's nothing else on her in all of her on all of his uh, notes and writings. And so, so I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if he named the queen of cats Beruthiel and there created is this whole mythology? So. There is one uh, Easter egg with the cat god, though, uh, in the Elric books. Uh, Elric summons the god of cats, who is named Merslar, who is ah. the the uh, which is the name of the the cat uh, creator goddess. Yeah, and uh, which I you know would never have remembered that in a thousand years, except I had read this so many times and then was reading the Elric books and was like, well, wait a minute. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, I, I will tell you one thing that Tad Williams did that drove me up the wall as a uh, long, long, long time Tolkien fan um, is that he, he so he created not only the mythology, but a lot of names and words uh, that these cats use throughout the book. Um, and so it wasn't quite a full, you know, he wasn't creating Elvish the way Tolkien did, but he did have a pronunciation guide. Um, or, you know, something approximating one. <laughs> he said, every C is pronounced as an S. Um, yes. Every C is an S, where in Tolkien, every C is a K. And so <laughs> I'm reading Mir, what was it, Mirslar? Mir, yeah, Mir? No, it looks like Mirklar. Mirklar, yeah. yeah. I, uh, 
yeah. And I'm like, why are you doing this to me, man? I'm here. <laughs> it's uh, it's very, and that is that is like uh, a lot of it is is straight homage to Watership Down too, and the, yeah. you know the same uh, uh, occasional words that get used more and more as you sort of build up a thing with them. Uh, he has the the epigraph, epigrams, epigraphs, whatever the uh, the little quotes before the beginning each chapter. Of the chapter yeah. yeah, which is. Which was more popular, you know, back in the day, but it's very, very reminiscent of Watership Down. There, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know if it's homage or training the, the treading the same ground. I don't know how much of that his publishers had him do or what, but uh, you can pick it out if you have read both books frequently and obsessively because you they were the only talking animal books available when you were a child <laughs> to take an example at random. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of talking animal books, I guess... <laughs> Um, ultimately, when what you've mentioned Watership Down a bunch of times, I keep having Animal Farm run through my mind, uh, where yeah. you know you get these kind of mid-century um, talking animal books that are um, uh, contemporary political. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Allegory. Allegory. Yeah. yeah, and and so they they have something to say about the current situation, and uh, at their best moments, something to say about the human condition, and that, and that's all great. Uh, but this was this felt much more like I want to create a talking animal book that is in, instead of trying to delve into the mysteries of human nature, just I want to tell the exact same stories that I love and that you love uh, just, you know, with four paws and a tail instead of two feet. Right. So ultimately, yeah. ultimately, this book is just a giant love letter to the fantasy genre and uh, in some ways to Tolkien himself. Right. Oh, it, it absolutely is. The, uh, the, uh, I think some of those parallels were lost on me as a kid because while I read The Hobbit, I, I read Lord of the Rings, but it was, you know, when you're seven, uh, the, okay, some of you listening are like, yes, I read it at seven and loved it. It was a bit of a slog for me at seven. I read it anyway because we didn't have that many fantasy novels available, and I had read all of the Star Trek novelizations that were currently on the market. <laughs> so uh, it... I, I did not see the parallels quite so clearly until I was an adult and had gone back and read Lord of the Rings. And was like, oh, okay, yeah, that, this is you're you're basically going to visit Galadriel, except uh, and oh, and Galadriel's not going to be helpful as it turns <laughs> out. Well, right. once again, all right, <laughs> carry yeah. on. And isn't it interesting to um, to have a book like this that? You know, putting on my uh, my critical glasses or my hat or whatever. Nice hat, by the way. Oh, thank um, you. Putting it's an on Indiana my, Jones model. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Putting on my critical hat, I can read this book and recognize how much fun it is and how skillfully done it is. I mean, yeah, it is a first book. It's not perfect, you know, in its writing or whatever. But it is. It's it's well done. It's a lot of fun, and yet. I, to be honest, I don't think that I'll come back to this a bunch, you know, maybe once more if my one of my kids wants to read it and I'll read it with them or something like that. But when we hit something at the right age, the sort of Shannara was that for me. I read it when I was nine, blew me away, had no idea what the Lord of the Rings was. I'd never heard of that, you know. And so I read the sort of Shannara, absolutely, lo absolutely loved it. And now I can put on my critical hat and say, oh, okay, well, here's this problem with it. And, that, oh, that was ultra derivative. That wasn't even creative at all or whatever. And right. yet just love it anyway. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I love having books like that in our lives that y and anybody on the planet could come to you and list a hundred reasons why it's a bad book. And you just go, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. I love, I love it. Uh, and obviously, this is not one of those books. This is... Uh, it's a good book. It's a fun book. It's a recommendable book. Uh, but I guess I'm just saying it ultimately it is. Um, it did not hit you at the proper age of wonder to be one of your, your comfort read. Return exactly. to Yeah. 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 And so, it, you know, I'm actually curious and we, we do um, a lot of topic discussions on discord. So for everybody listening, go hop on discord, go into the episode discussion channel for this episode. Um, and uh, I want to hear, what people's comfort reads are the book that you just don't care what other people think of it it might be a good book might be a bad book you know that's not the question the question is what is your <laughs> comfort read with the, the thing you'll love until the day you die just because you love it um Two anyway minor star trek novels as it happens just because really? of that the age yeah uh 
Uh, her is sung by Janet Kagan and uh, The Wounded Sky by Diane Duane, who, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. I've got a couple Star Wars novels uh, in a similar place in my mind as well. So yep. I never did the Star Trek novelizations, though. What's the first one that I should read? Was it uh, first honestly, the, fir- uh, the, the Wounded Sky is actually a really good place to start. Uh, they they because, you know, of uh, the fact that Paramount owns it and all they're all self-contained. They make very few changes to, mm. you know, it, it, it's episodic in that uh, you don't have to read five of them to understand what happens in the next one. Right. Uh, the Wounded Sky is really good. It's uh, it's short and uh, it's about, it, it has really good aliens. Uh, a lot of the writers just did the the standard Star Wars or Star Trek thing of all the aliens are humans with, humans with like, makeup. makeup job. <laughs> and this, uh, this one is like, no, what if we have a Horda who works, you know, at uh, uh, one of the, the big shuffling rock monsters from the uh, oh, yeah. old Trek episode that who is an officer? Well, you know, what if we have a giant pillar of tentacles who works there? And uh, <laughs> so good aliens and uh, just just a fun, weird uh, book about uh, physics and accidentally destroying the universe with warp space and whatnot. Well, well recommended. I will keep that in mind. It is duly <laughs> noted. And as long as we're talking about other books, uh, by the way, we should... <laughs> probably talk about yours, A House with Good Bones. Before we do, I will ask um, any final thoughts uh, on Tail Chaser's song, any last uh, words of wisdom, words of recommendation, if somebody wants to uh, give this one a try for the first time or go back to it? Uh, if you love Tad Williams' work, um, th- that's not a guarantee you'll love this one, honestly. Uh, <laughs> if you... If, however, you're like, Tad Williams is fine, but I can't do another Dragon Bone Chair epic, uh, this is fine. Pick this one up. <laughs> it's, it's, it is not, uh, you are not going to be uh, trapped for uh, 5,000 pages right. of, yeah. Uh, and it's just fun. It's, it is, it is fun and weird and uh, it takes what, should be honestly a simple kind of hokey premise and is like i am going to play it absolutely straight and just go completely wild with it and amen to that the words i was going to use uh uh, (laughs) fun uh wild and over the top i don't know something like that it's just it's it really is uh quite a thing he mentions in the prologue that he struggle to get anybody to buy it you know got oh, yes. some rejection letters and we don't do talking animal books and whatever and then somebody finally uh said yes and i would have loved to be a fly on the wall uh for the editor who was reading that book going <laughs> you know what let's go for it <laughs> well and it has apparently been in print since that time oh, and uh i think bankrolled a lot of his ability to work on on some of the big fantasy novels mm-hmm. so uh it's yeah, it, it did really well. And uh, so, yay! I mean, great. It's, it's fantastic when that happens for someone We're like, yeah. I'm just going to write this weird thing that I want to exist. And Oh, look, it did well. There you go. Well, let's talk about a house with good bones. If people are looking for it, it's going to be under T Kingfisher. Okay. Yes. T, the initial I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Tiffany on this one. I, we're, <laughs> We're just going to make up whatever that initial should be. Okay. So uh, uh, I sometimes tell people Terrence. And, there you uh, go. <laughs> and they look at me and I'm like, what? Terrence is a good name. <laughs> <laughs> so look up T-, T Kingfisher. A House with Good Bones is coming out at the end of March. This is a horror novel. Now, yes. I, I want to ask you there are horror novels and horror novels. Which one is this? Give us an elevator pitch. What kind of book are we looking at here? Um, This is. Uh, uh, this is a book that I got to about the three quarter mark and was like, I could have this thing here be the final horror of the book and that would be fine. And most people would be like, okay, that was a perfectly scary thing at the end, but God damn it. No. And in, in that regard, I, I somewhat like tell just, I'm like, nope, we're turning this up to 11. Let's just have this get really messed up at the end. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's, a contemporary horror set in the suburbs. A our heroine uh, comes back to check on her mom because her mom is acting weird and discovers that uh, that 
it's gone a little Stepford Wives. It has no resemblance to Stepford Wives at all. It's it's just that everything is now beige tract housing. And uh, <laughs> she's like, this is weird. Mom is acting weird. Something very strange is going on. There are vultures perched on the mailbox and circling the house. Stuff is going bad. And, uh, and stuff does go bad. And then stuff goes even worse than bad. And uh, yeah, it's... It was fun to write. Uh, like many of my horror novels, it is funny uh, because I am very bad at writing things that aren't funny after a long period of time. I just get <laughs> bored and start cracking jokes. So uh, people are always like, this is a really funny horror novel. And I'm like, yeah, that's that that's a problem. But I mean, whenever I'm scared or in you know dire stress, I start making jokes. So I figure a lot of us do that. Uh, I, yeah. I can relate. Yeah, it's uh, it's fun. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, so people should go check it out. A House with Good Bones. Uh, I was saying before we started recording, I love this title so much. <laughs> and apparently it was uh, the marketing team came uh, up with marketing it. Marketing uh, came up with that, yes. Uh, so uh, I was very impressed. So. <laughs> there's there's a reason they make money, I guess. Okay, fine. We'll let them yeah. keep their jobs. Uh, a house well, that with... and I'm not going to buy ad spots. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> A House with Good Bones comes out at the end of March. Uh, so people should please go check that out. Redwombatstudio.com is your website, Ursula. Yes, um, I write a lot of fantasy novels too, if you, oh, if you would prefer something less yep. suburban. Yeah. It, you, you could have just stopped at a lot. I write a lot. Go, <laughs> go to redwombatstudio.com and look. I mean, you, and you illustrate as well. You are extremely prolific. Uh, so congratulations on that. Um, there are those who love writing and there are th those who love being a writer. Um, and you definitely seem like the former, um, cause uh, you, you crank out a lot of stuff. I, I, much like Dor Dorothy Parker, I love having written, uh, <laughs> yeah, I... exactly, exactly. <laughs> so... Yeah. Um, okay. So, oh, uh, I did want to mention in closing because I forgot to bring it up in our discussion of tail chaser song was that there are some spots where I cracked up. Um, where he actually did make me laugh pretty hard. And I, I think he meant to. The one that's coming to mind right off the top of my head is um, it's way back in like chapter five or something like that, where he's just starting out on his quest and he's remembering his mother's lessons. And what did his mother teach him? Catechisms. I just died. I died. <laughs> I was like, okay, well done. Okay, that's perfect. Hey. Yep. <laughs> Uh, yep. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, hopefully everybody uh, either has enjoyed or will enjoy the uh, Tail Chaser song, not the, but Tail Chaser song by Tad Williams. If you haven't read it, please go check it out. It really is a lot of fun. Uh, but do that right after you go to redwombatstudio.com um, and check out uh, the, the entire T. Kingfisher oeuvre. Okay, we're going to go with that <laughs> word on this one. Um, and I'm just amazed I, you can pronounce it. That is a word I see written and have never tried to say myself. Honestly, I can pronounce it, but just then, and most often I, <laughs> I deliberately mispronounce it because it's way more fun that way. Um, and then I don't sound like a jerk. Um, <laughs> so, so Fair. uh, a house with good bones, end of March, everybody buy a copy and, uh, and let us know what you think of it. Uh, thank you so much, Ursula, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Oh, delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. And for everybody else, thank you for listening. Go to thelegendarium.com where you can find uh, past episodes grouped by author or by subject. Uh, you can find links to Patreon to support the show, which we greatly appreciate. And you can also find a link to Discord. It is an open server. If you just click on the link there, um, you're in and you are going to have a bunch of really really great discussions with other fantasy and sci-fi fans. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time.